Brad. Hey, can you guys hear me? I got a different setup than normal. All right, great. Yeah. <clears throat> Great. All right, six o'clock. So Nancy, you can Excellent. take us off. Yeah, I call this meeting the Natural Resource Committee for October twelfth, two thousand twenty-two, to order. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have we have a pretty short agenda. There was one item that I wanted to move from communications to discussion, but that's totally up to you all. You can, and that was the street tree code update. Um, there's quite a few uh, additional items in communications, not the, uh, including Arbor Day uh, that I want to get give you some updates on. Um, so uh, was was there anything else on the agenda you guys wanted to rearrange? Oh, there's Chris. Hang on. Yeah. Okay, great. So for the record, Chris has joined us. Yay. Hi, Chris. Greetings, everybody. Good Greetings to, see to you. Thanks for joining. Yeah, it's good to see everyone. Good to see you. <laughs> well, what's your name, anyway? Yeah. <laughs> Working on it. So, let's see. Should we, do we start with communication items? Is that what we're doing? Oh, uh, that usually comes at the I, end, but. I know, my ag I got my agenda. I thought I printed it out and I didn't, so. All right, yeah, the way we've got it set up right now is adoption of the agenda comes for, well, call to order, adoption of the agenda, uh, where you can rearrange things, <laughs> and then public comment for people who have items that are not on the agenda. We don't appear to have any. <laughs> Public commenters. Okay, I found my uh, I found my actual agenda, so I'm good. Okay, you good? All right. <laughs> like I know it's here somewhere. <laughs> I had every page in the world other. And I and now I'm seeing this now. I aired and I put communication items on the future agenda, so that's a mistake. Um, okay. That should be under communication item. Okay. Mm. Are we good with the agenda? Anybody want to move anything? Add anything? Now my dog's going to be downstairs whining for some strange reason. <laughs> Finally got the neighbor one to quit howling. Now my she's going to start acting up. Well, someone's got to chime in at some, keep the chorus going. Yeah, exactly. It's my neighborhood. Uh, so, okay, let's so see. Um, do we have anybody from the public for public comment? It doesn't look like it. I do not. Okay. Um, so let's see. New business? New business. That means uh, we have a Heritage Tree nomination to discuss. Yay. I did. I did send the link over to Dee Dee, but it was a bit last minute, mm -hmm. um, so I'm not sure if she will join us. Okay. Um, I, 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 she and I measured the tree together, so. <laughs> and I measured it too. You I, measure it's impressive. I, I went with yours. Yeah. Uh, yours was an inch bigger than mine. Oh well. I think I got 51 and you got 52. That's all we're DDHs. And I'm so, you know, like I actually had in my lab at school because we measured DBH all the time. I actually had a permanent mark on the wall. And before we go, I make everybody go, okay, where is it on you? It's like up here on me because I'm really sure. Right, right. I was always, I'm always surprised at how much higher it is than I think it is. Yeah. Yeah. You know, for me, it was like actually at my shoulder. So, wow. Well, all right. That seems. It too does high. seems too high, right? Yeah, it seems it's, too high. For you. What is it just for the? It's one point three seven meters above the ground. One point three. So what's that in feet? I don't have any idea. <laughs> okay. I, I well, a meter this. is about three feet. Yeah. So oh it's... no, kidding. Yeah. Uh, okay. All right. So Thank you. That's. Um. So then, so then a third of that would be another 
foot or so, if I recall. Not it's remember. Like four, it's like it's four something. Four something. Uh, yeah. Four point something. Yeah. All right. Good to know. That would explain why mine was smaller. <laughs> That would that would explain it. Hey, uh, sorry, talk about the heritage tree. Do you have? But I'm not about to. De- I'm going to defer to the doctor on this one. <laughs> so me? <Or> you? <laughs> oh, I guess uh, I'm the doctor. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's it's a beautiful old oak. It's it, it's a half block from my house, um, and I have loved that tree forever. It's just gorgeous. And I have to admit, the first thing after the ice storm when I came outside was I looked to see what shape that oak was in, and I think it lost one branch that had already been damaged. It really stood up well. Um, and then I looked the other direction, which is the sycamore that's on our heritage tree list, <laughs> and it lost a couple of minor branches. So every, the heritage trees did really well, or at least for both those trees. And so the oak is beautiful. It is huge. Um, what age did we get? Something like, do you remember? I'm really bad with numbers, Pete. Um, it's, a, it's it's loading. The application's okay. loading. So I'm reading 264, yeah. 264. Yeah, that was, it's a website where you put in the deviation. It gives you, and, it, and supposedly that age is plus or minus 10%. But, you know, that puts it here before any of the Europeans got here. So. All right. So. This tree is at 801 JQ Adams Street, which is real close to the corner of 8th, I believe. Yeah, it is. It's on the corner. The house is on the corner of 8th. There's a lot of photos in here because I used the photos that Dee Dee sent as, ah. well, as well as some that I took. Okay. So I thought the canopy spread on the application form was under. They said 35, but I would... He did that. Uh, so I didn't. She uh, said okay. she pasted it off. So we didn't measure it. I had a tape, but she goes, oh, no, I pasted it off. I'm like, okay. But you'll see why when you see the picture. It is in excellent condition, apparently. Yeah. Did you want... And you said it had been trimmed recently? Yeah. The, the owner told me that she and her neighbor because it's right, it hangs over the neighbor's house, that they had split the cost of getting it trimmed and any dead branches removed from it. And I don't even remember them doing that. So right, it's half a block away, I usually know when things are going on. <laughs> so they must not have done a lot to it. It's, it's a beautiful tree. Yeah. And looking at this aerial photo, which is 2021, this scale bar is... T- showing as 20 feet so it's a good good canopy yeah probably closer to 60. yeah um little article about why oregon white oaks are so special (laughs) they're very nice yep um and then what is that website 262 is that yeah uh yeah it's I could find it. I've got it on my computer, but it's a it's a tree estimate, an arbor place. So All right, let me try to get this thing in the screen. I'm not about to attempt to core an oak that size for <laughs> incredibly hard to core. <laughs> sure. I think I have a core that's big enough to reach the middle, but I don't know anybody strong enough to even do it. <laughs> ah, yeah. I wouldn't yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So here's here's what I took the other day photo. Yeah. And uh, there's a little nicer day, which is good. Yeah, it is a beautiful tree. And then I took it from all the corners, you know, the different street corners. And, and I have to say that house is actually a relatively new house. That used to be just an old shack there that they raised eight kids in. I think they have eight kids. Um, and then they tore that down and had this house put up and they intentionally had it put up. So it looks like it's an old house and it sits in the neighborhood. So it's just amazing. I just love it. So. Right. Okay. So it went through H historic review board review. I, I didn't look up a whole lot of details, but I did really see that it was a designated landmark. Right. Um, so that's good. Uh, that the landmark status for the historic review board doesn't actually have anything to do with any of the landscaping on the property, just so you all know. Um, the HRB really just looks at the structure and the architecture. Um, occasionally, there is an 
inventory form that will mention significant landscaping and even significant trees. I did not check the inventory form to see whether or not this tree was listed on the inventory, um, which would be a good piece of information to add for the city commission um, when that goes before them. Um, I'll keep scrolling because it's so nice to look at. It is a beautiful tree. And it is definitely on the property. It's on the property line because when they built that house, the city was telling them they had to cut it down because it was on the property line. They needed to put the sidewalk through and everybody in the neighborhood threw a fit. And so you can see where the sidewalk is curved in front of their house so that the tree is safe. Right. Yeah. I noticed that when I was out there, I was yeah. like, oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know when that happened, but. It was when they built the house. I think they built the house in like, I'm going to say about 2000. Okay. Well, that's a perfect example of what we want to do mm -hmm. when we're requiring public sidewalk improvements. That Unfortunately, the city was not was pushing to cut it down and all the neighbors went, no, we're not doing that. Yeah. Save the street. Yeah. So it got saved and the sidewalk got curved, which is wonderful. And I think that now we actually added that a couple of line, well, one line basically to the public improvement code that said that, you know, this, the public works engineer can modify a public work standard in order to save a tree. Um, and uh, it's just a small thing in the code, but it, it means a lot in terms yeah. of the authority and the, the need to the preserve stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so that is a success story. And uh, as far as meeting the code criteria, um, let me see. Um, I am on the wrong page. Um, of course, now I can't see it. Was I seeing a for sale sign in front of that house? Yes. The house are. is for sale. Um, the owner's hoping she wants the tree to be saved, and you know she's and and the realtor has been told that this is in the works to put right. this up. Okay. So. so the thought is that she would have it protected. And then just disclose that to any potential buyers and yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that makes sense. Good question. And at one point the realtor was saying, well, you know, they could put an RV thing storage in there and they might have to cut the tree down. And, and, so, and you can see that they, the, the property owners actually went and bought an RV because they're actually, they're, they're moving to some property that their son owns in Dallas and they're going to build a tiny home. But in the meantime, they're going to build, live in that RV for a year or two till they get their tiny home built. So, you know, but so you can see the RV fits in there just fine without damaging the tree. So, yeah, I guess the, the question is, is do we have any kind of responsibility to make sure that all that is clear or does that firmly land on the realtor so, and the current owner? The what I want to do in that regard is make sure that before or concurrent with the city commission's review of the um, nomination, assuming that you all support it, um, is make sure that the property owner has gotten the restrictive covenant, if not recorded, at least signed so that we can put it in the packet right. for the city commission. And that way, the uh, recordation of the restrictive covenant would follow the city commission's approval, but be an, a necessary part of the review, because we've actually been having a bit of trouble following up with the owners to get the covenants recorded mm -hmm. after the fact. Okay. Um, and uh, that's something that we're working through on some of the other nominations that have already been improved. Yeah, um, I know I can, I can coordinate with the owner. Too. Okay. Yeah. And that way, um, it's part of she the She really wants that tree saved. She really does. <laughs> yeah. And that way, it would be part of the title. I have and a quick run. question when you yeah. have a moment. Go for it. Um, it looks like there's a flowering plum going on it's right next to that tree and that needs to be cut down 
There's also ivy going up in the tree. Is she it included? Ivy. Like, no, it's actually, I, you cut that tree at the base and it would be not up in there. Okay. I was just curious oh, if yeah. the oak is like <laughs> so I'm hugging. No, it's, I'm it's just curious. right next to it. It's, it's got a diameter of maybe an inch. Are you guys seeing the tree? I can see yeah. the limits like right on the right. Okay, yeah. Oh, yeah. Can you see me waving the cursor here? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, it's right by it. So. Yeah. She also has a lot full of ivy, so. I was just wondering what was going on with that plum, because it looks like it's, you know, a part of the oak. <laughs> no, it's, it was a gift from the birds, and it is on the ground, so. <laughs> Yeah, I don't really have a good photo of that side of the tree because it was on the property and I was trying to just kind of work off of the sidewalk. Um, but yeah, I didn't see any but problems yeah. with it. Yeah. Yeah, we looked at it when we were measuring things. Cool. We could get in between the, the plum and the trunk of the trees. So. Right, with the tape. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it took Dee Dee and I both, I think, she had to walk around while held it and measured it. So, okay. Uh, let's see. No, that one. No, that one. So, um, that's not one I was looking for either. Sorry for the clicking around. It's very <laughs> distracting. Um, so, heritage criteria. At least one heritage criterion must be must be met. The tree or stand of trees associated with events that have made a significant contribution to the broad pattern of Oregon City's history, or this tree or stand of trees is associated with the life of a person or group of historic significance to the Oregon City, or the tree or stand of trees represents a significant and distinguishable presence within Oregon City, or the tree or stand of trees has age, size, or species significance either horticultural or ecological, which contributes to Oregon City's heritage status. I put three and four, because it is it is a ma major tree in our neighborhood. There aren't a lot of really big trees like that. And um, it's obviously has age size and white oaks are, you know, white oaks are a very important ecological species and they're getting cut down like crazy, so. I think we need to protect all the white oaks we possibly can. All kinds of bird species that are, you know, white-breasted nuthatches are completely dependent on oak trees, so. Yeah, it definitely seems to have a distinguishable presence. And obvious, yeah, and the age, too. Yeah. I was astounded at the age, yeah, once. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I figured, you know, it was going to be like 100 to 200, and then that was like, wow, that's more than I would have projected it. So, yeah, but I hope it's amazing. grow very slowly. So, great. Okay. And then the site and condition criteria all must be satisfied. It cannot be an invasive species. Obviously, it's not. And if it is on private property, then the owner consents. And they clearly do. Yeah. Um, so all the criteria that are relevant are met and the options for the Natural Resources Committee are to recommend approval as proposed, recommend approval of some of the nomination. I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> There's more than one tree. <laughs> exactly. Oh, there you go. Um, or do not recommend approval of the nomination. So it's all up to you all. Do we want to do a thumbs up or a thumbs down or do you just want to? We can do a visual thumbs up because we're all on camera with the, uh, I believe. <laughs> all right. And I'm seeing thumbs up across the board. Nice. Yay. All right. Thank you. So that's the first item. I will tell the homeowner when I see her next, which is probably tomorrow. <laughs> Great. And uh, if they have any questions at all about the covenant and what happens next uh, with city commission, I'm happy to talk to them. Okay. Um, right, thank you. Uh, so let me close out uh, some of this. Stop sharing. Okay. Um, so communication. 
Right. So, well, the, there was also the uh, street tree uh, code update mm. that I wanted to move discussion. Okay. That's right. Um, okay, let's do the street tree thing then. Okay, so um, um, let me uh, share the screen again. Again. And go over to this website. So I'm going to enlarge this a bit. Can everybody see that? Yeah. Okay, so Jude Tadeus, who's assistant planner in our department, has been with us a couple months now, has been uh, tasked with uh, shepherding this minor code amendment along. Uh, we're calling it a minor code amendment because it's not a big deal and it's not modifying the entire street tree code. It's actually only changing one section of it. Um, but Jude has put a lot of thought and care into this website which uh, is currently housed under the long range and ongoing planning projects as part of our planning web page uh, in the big blue menu bar on the right when you go there. So um, I think that's probably a good space for it. Um, the level of uh, public outreach that we're doing with this is fairly, fairly limited um, at this point. Um, but uh, what we're trying to do is inform people about the amendment and about the timeline. Um, right now, we're in doing public information through fall of 2022. And then there will be a legislative hearing process in winter of 2022. That's a misspelling. Um, and then going into adoption spring 20, 2023. Um, we've got a comment link here where people can, after they've read the amendment and the page at the um, they can go in here and send comments via email um, and contact Jude if they have any questions. Uh, basically, is a summary here of what's going on. So the code would be revised so that property owners with less than three foot planting strip do not have to replant um, and they do not have to pay in fee in lieu for uh, planter uh, tree removal with a plan of less than three feet. Uh, there's some language being clarified about the required replacement tree caliper size. And uh, we would still allow property owners to replant appropriate trees from the new street list, the street tree list, if they wish to. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so far, apparently, we've only had a couple of comments. Uh, so uh, we will um, want to talk this up a little bit, put it in the trail news, uh, put it in our Friday highlights. Put a, we ask the, um, the McLaughlin Neighborhood Association to say something about it because most of these are in the McLaughlin Neighborhood. Okay. Um, yeah. I wonder if there was another neighborhood that had them, but I know that a great deal of them are in the McLaughlin neighborhood. Yeah, I think what we want to do is uh, um, actually update the uh, city uh, citizen involvement committee commission and the neighborhood associations of the website and their opportunity to comment. Um, there's a brief history on what led to this code amendment, which has been a long time in the making, obviously, because uh, we've made various changes to the street tree code over the years. Um, and we'll be making more in the future, uh, more comprehensively, I assume. Um, then we also have the Public Works Department has set up a sidewalk replacement assistant grant program for um, sidewalk repair where there were clearly tree roots involved. Um, that program is ongoing and it assists some property owners with finances if they have a buckled sidewalk. And um, it also mentions the work that's been done by you all in putting the code amendments together. 
as well as uh, has links to the new street tree list and uh, then links to the uh, existing information that we already have on the city website about street trees and why they're important and how they contribute to our quality of life as well as help us with our street tree tree city usa status um, some visual aids to help people understand some of the issues associated with buckling and uh, really did a lot of work Jude did a lot of work on on the, the message here but if you have if you have comments on this either individually or as a group please send them my way um, some information about how to measure a planner's trip and then at the very bottom we have what's coming up in terms of outreach uh, so tonight's meeting in addition to the one we had on june 7th and in the city commission august 17th tonight's meeting citizen involvement committee november 7th nrc again on november 9th go to the planning commission for a work session in december on the 12th and then city commission on december 13th and then the revisions themselves which are redlined here so um, this is section 1208035 true removal and replacement um, stating that a, a diseased or hazardous tree tree uh, may be removed if replaced with one new tree for each diseased or hazardous tree. Hazardous trees have raised the adjacent sidewalk in a manner which doesn't comply with the Americans with Disabilities Act may be removed and replaced without approval of an arborist. All replaced tree trees shall have a minimum one and a half inch caliper trunk measured six inches above the root crown. Um, exception is if the planter strip is three feet or less in width and that's uh, essentially it for now um, the revisions that may come later we haven't started working on yet but if you go to this section of code what what I see there is a mixture of maintenance obligations for existing street trees and new development code regulations for installation of street trees. So one, one option potentially is for us to split those out accordingly into a maintenance section and a new development section so that one is clearly a development standard and the other is just a maintenance standard. But yeah. Um, but we haven't really talked about that. We can we can make that a future agenda item when the time comes. I had a clarifying question. Um, it looks like in that that main document, Oregon City Street Tree List, um, that final edits document that's six pages. Um, I see that at the bottom there's a very small section um, where it, it refers people who want to plant native trees to a Portland plant list. Um, and it says the above trees are kind of like approved street trees. Um, but then it doesn't look like actually those ones are native. So I guess I'm just wondering, like, is there a list of uh, recommended native trees on this document? Or is it just like a reference to the larger list? Because it looks like there should be a section for it, but. Um, I don't think we ever developed a list of just native trees. Okay, because there, there was a section, where does it say? Is that in general, native trees are not recommended as street trees? I guess I'm a little bit confused about that. Um, because it attributes that, let's see, within parking due to so the large- I can help answer the native yeah. tree question yeah. if you want to talk about that now. So the main reason is native trees, very few of them are tolerant of street environments, particularly heat, pollution, the amount of damage street trees have to tolerate, and, um, and all sorts of things like that. So mostly it's that the native trees were adapted for the more 
natural environment that we have in our natural areas and and um but when it comes to developed areas the habitat has changed substantially that their tolerance level is so low that very few of the native species we have and like I don't know, coming from Michigan, I feel like there's a lot more diversity of trees. Um, this, the relatively small palette of trees that we have um, abundantly available for planting anyway, um, have harder tolerance, have greater intolerance to those street tree conditions. So in, that, in those cases, it's generally recommended to plant them where you can, if you can, um, but if it's really developed high heat, high pollution, high exposure, some of those native plants are not gonna be able to tolerate those conditions. So it's not that we're anti-native, they just have a harder time surviving and establishing well. So when they do, it's usually because they were there and established before development, like that giant oak that, um, we recommended for the heritage tree. So it was there, it established um, long before development, the way we have it now has established and changed the environment. So we have to choose trees that are much more tolerant to urban conditions compared to what some of our more native trees have been adapted for. Does that answer the question? Yeah, thank you so much for clarifying. Um, I think that when I think of trees, like I, I, for the ones that I'm thinking of that I've often seen successful in um, planter, like, you know, not, not super narrow planter strips um, are like, probably like trees, like kind of walking that line between a shrub and a tree. And so I think that looking at the, um, like the height on a lot of these, um, the ones that I'm thinking of are a lot shorter. <laughs> so that makes sense. Thank you. It might be, but it sounds confusing because it sounds like you're reading a document that says there's a link to someplace where it lists native trees. And yeah, I mean, the Portland plant list is such a big document. If someone yeah. was actually looking for them, that would be kind of an overwhelming task. Right. Maybe, maybe we could do something like put an asterisk um, for our street tree list if they're native. Yeah, well, that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Actually, and then, I believe that um, that information is on there. It's, it's definitely one of the, oh. the the criterion that are listed. Yeah, it is. Yeah, um, it's a simple it's, yay or nay. It's one of the columns. Oh, it is. Yeah. Duh. Um, <laughs> thanks. Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> it's been too long since I read We're that. We're so thing darn over good. Over we didn't know. <laughs> um, I don't even remember, and I looked at it a lot. <laughs> We could probably, yeah, I mean, whatever formatting changes or, or modifications you'd like to make to the list, it looks a little bit like it needs some editing now that I'm looking at it now, but not a whole lot. Um, I think that Jude went through and corrected, if he didn't, I'll ask him, corrected or updated some of the links that are on, the hyperlinks on it. Um, which is helpful uh, that needed doing. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. But yeah, I'll talk to him about doing that. Um, I know that the Metro Green Streets list, which is a pretty old book, had a mixture of native large trees and uh, other trees, but they were pretty clear that they wouldn't recommend them in anything less than a 10 foot strip or something like that. Um, but which we don't have, if we do, they're, they're, they're rare. Um, and so the other aspect of it is certainly if, you know, the one we just looked at, for example, could qualify as a street tree because it's within 10 feet of the back of the sidewalk easily. It's actually right there. So, um, if an owner chose to not plant in the planter strip and designate that tree as a street tree, it would be subject to the street tree code as well as the heritage tree code. And, um, in this situation, it would be subject to the heritage tree code and any, and has that added protection of the, of the private covenant. Um, so, uh, which, uh, 
Yeah. Pete, is there something you can do to just pass on that uh, to Jude personally that uh, they really did a great job and provided a lot of really great information that Thanks. seems kind of feels above and beyond to me. I don't know if we can do that in an official way or just uh, pass the word way, but especially for somebody new to our city I potentially, or at least, to. yeah, please pass that on because that's a really informative page that they built. Yeah, kudos to Jude. He, uh, he, he does go the extra mile on a lot of this uh, outreach stuff. And um it's uh, it's good to see because you know i've been doing this a long time and sometimes i just transmit information <laughs> so uh he's got the the enthusiasm and the uh, understanding of a, of a lay person too because some of this information is new to him yeah. uh, so uh, that's helpful and refreshing um good yeah thank you i will yeah definitely and I don't know if it's on, I didn't see it. I haven't checked out the website yet for the amendment. Does he have a link to, does the Oregon City website have a link to the Tree City USA like website? Uh, let me look here. So it's good to give them additional resources for that. If we're, you know I'm excited that we're Tree City USA. I'm sure everyone else is too, but that's the one in case they want more information. <laughs> Um, let me share to show you what we do have. Uh, so we'll update this list here. Trees in Oregon City, Pacific Northwest ISA, and Friends of Trees, EAB. Okay, yeah, we can we can add to this Trees to the USA. Yeah, that would be great. Um, yeah. Yep. And I should mention that. Um, the IT department has uh, undertaken the task of actually updating the city website. Yay! Um, and are moving it over to a new format, which would be launching in 2023, according to the IT coordinator, David Knoll. Um, so let us know this morning. Um, they are looking for photographs. So um, didn't specify what, just looking for photographs. So um, we have a bunch, but we're limited because we have to use like stock photos a lot of the time or, you know, that are licensed or have permission if it's going to be something more local and personal. So if you all know people who are voluntarily willing to give the city photos that are, you know, good quality and indicative of the built or natural environment, um, we would love to see them and pass them along. I can definitely help out with that. Um, I take a lot of pictures for my work and um, do you, is there like a deadline that they would have to be in by or any sort of direction? You said it's, they didn't um, specify what they had to be pictured. No, I, I don't know, but um, let me uh, put that in an email to David and I can ask, um, see what the parameters are. Uh, I doubt very much it's something where, well, I, I, to be honest, I don't know when the deadline is, but I will ask him. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Is that something that could be worth crowdsourcing on like, for example, some of the local Facebook groups or those kinds of things, or would that create I would more think work? so. Yeah, I mean, right now we've had such staff turnover, you know, we lost our communications coordinator, which we're trying to rehire and um, they were helpful and a lot of this stuff, how to crowdsource photos and through through the Facebook website and everything else. So um, I think your offer would be graciously accepted. Um, okay. um, I would coordinate with David Knoll in IT um, and see, see, what, see what they say. It's K-O-N-L-L. -L. But uh, you can send me an email and I'll shoot, them, shoot it along to him. Yeah, I mean, I think all we would need kind of as a group here is like, what would the language be and what are the links? So to make it easy for 
anybody on the street to get out their phone and take a picture of something they think is great and get mm-hmm. in front of somebody who can say yes or no, this is good for, for our production. Like, I, I guess the other side of the coin is we can create some work if we if we get too good at publicizing this idea. <laughs> um, I agree. Um, there's a number of different programs of that are or public outreach both now and in the future that would benefit from um, crowdsourcing photographs of particular projects in areas of the city. So I think this is an ongoing type of uh, problem that we have. Uh, uh, not a problem necessarily, but need. Um, it came up at the same, it came up when we were doing OC 2040, the comprehensive plan update as well. We were looking for people to send photographs of the city and kind of have a photograph contest in order to generate interest during COVID. It was very difficult to do public outreach during COVID. Um, and that was one of the ideas that our consultants thought would help people get involved. And so, um, I'm open to any ideas you have. We should maybe okay. table this to a uh, future agenda. Yeah, I'll, I'll take some ownership of that, Pete, and I'll, cool. I'll message you and uh, David Knoll and just try to like work towards getting to the messaging and just sharing that with you know this group and our network. I think even just the people on this call could mm. potentially get this offer in front of a lot of people because people in our community want to contribute, right? Yeah, um, absolutely. I, I, yeah, okay, I'll well, make myself you. some tasks. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, and then uh, we also have, uh, well, I know I'm just brainstorming, so I'll, I'm gonna shut my mouth because <laughs> I likely go off on some tangent. Um, great, thank you. Um, let's see. So that takes care of the additional discussion item, not to say any of the communications aren't discussion items, but we can move along to that if you're ready. That sounds good. Let's move on to the communications. Um, okay, cool. Let's see where am I? Okay. So, um, First one I'll cover is the uh, Friends of Trees Neighborhood Planting Update, um, which will be at River Crest Park on November 20th. Uh, Parks Department is going to help coordinate the uh, by making sure that there's plenty of room for the Friends of Trees to assemble with their trucks and trees. Um, and um, talked to John Waverly about that this morning. Um, Saturday, November the 12th from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m., uh, which is a month out uh, to I'm the day. I'm confused because it says up above Saturday, November 20th, and then down here it says when Saturday, November Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. That was a glitch in their communication. It is, um, it is the 12th. Okay. Um, Saturday the 12th. Just making sure. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you for catching that. I remember that now. Because uh, November the 12th, yeah, it is a Sunday. Yeah, so not on a Sunday. Um, and they are going to do a cruise of about four to eight people and plant seven to nine large stock trees. Um, and there'll be breakfast provided, snacky things, gloves, tools, guidance, and uh, individuals and groups welcome. As always, they are looking for more planting coordinators. I'm not sure if there's still time to people to enroll in that program through their website, though I haven't checked that out. Um, and they oftentimes need people with trucks to help transport. Um, so that's going on. Um, let's move on to Arbor Day preparations. So um, I talked to John Waverly today about Arbor Day and they are planning to uh, uh, do the uh, 
some ceremony for the dedication of the Oregon Peace Tree Ginkgo down at Oregon Trail Center. They um, don't have all the details yet, and they are looking to improve their publicity and partnerships for the event. Um, so very open to that. Um, as far as having a Friends of Trees event going on the same day, uh, we have a contract with Friends of Trees to do another plantings on Arbor Day, but it can be uh, coordinated the same day or even at the same time. It's just that the vo there are going to be volunteers uh, helping out doing an Oregon City cleanup type activity with bark mulch and um, some some tree plantings that parks will be providing down at the EOT. And uh, so we've got some time to coordinate activities and improve the outreach and make sure that some of the groups that you all had mentioned can be involved. Um, and uh, Sam, do you want to update me on, on those, on uh, some of those groups you thought would be? Yeah. So um, um, last month there was a state ceremony dedication at ODF in Salem and they had a big, event um, inviting all the cities that had a peace tree to go and represent and um, and kind of dedicate not only the ODF's tree, but also recognize that this is a statewide um, program. Mm -hmm. Got lots of publicity. Uh, apparently there was even an article in Australia about it. So, so special. Um, and I got to meet tons of folks. And I told them that Oregon City has not yet had our dedication and everyone wants to come. Oh, really? <laughs> um, the state forester wants to come. Uh, the oh. folks in Gladstone have invited us to visit their peace tree and they can you know, give us a little tour. It's in the Gladstone Nature Park. I don't know if anyone's had a chance to visit. They did an excellent job just kind of giving us a standard. Um, of like how awesome it has to be for us. And um, they also have contacts with the folks they invited. And um, I have contacts from the Japanese American um, Association in Portland and other folks, mostly coming from Portland area, um, but trying to make sure that we are bringing the Japanese American community as a component of honored guests, but we can also include the VFW and other veteran associations, perfectly um, lo logical uh, group of folks to invite. Um, I have the contact name of the person who created the plaque content. Great. So they are all out of pre-manufactured plaques. <laughs> kind of missed the bus on that one, but we have access to get the content and we have, you know, the CCC and their welding program or other fabricators who could create a plaque, which is a part of the covenant requirement um, to make sure that folks know what, why this tree is so special. Oh, cool. um, yeah. And um, we also have a, every tree, Every city that gets a tree automatically gets a book that they can um, give to the library, the local library. So I have that book and it's signed by the author. And um, okay, it's in, I'm waiting to, I need to go through the library system to get that on the shelf. Um, but the last thing and that's most important is the peace tree itself needs attention. Um, Someone's been going through with like a weed eater or something, and there is a little bit of damage on the trunk. So um, someone needs to go down there and like pull the weeds and put down mulch because we can't have weed eaters killing our tree. So um, that's kind of priority number one in my book. Um, so I don't know who I have to. John Waverly. Uh, I mean, I can I send him an email. Pass that along. Yeah. Tell him it's priority. Yeah. <laughs> my husband's is has a lot of um like he goes by there often and he's like sending me pictures okay. so okay. i can't i can't not <laughs> emphasize yeah, john and, and kendall obviously who's our parks director would want to be uh, would be concerned about that so yeah, yeah. 
So, yeah, so I have a list of contacts of names and folks to invite. State Forester personally told me he wants to come. Wow. Um, and he, his name is Kao Mukumoto. He's super friendly. He's also Japanese American. Um, he lives all the way down in Coos Bay. So, but he frequently uh, commutes up to Salem. So um, he'd make a special trip to Oregon okay. City. Yeah, this is exciting. Uh, I'll be happy to put some time in and make this happen. So um, he also, we have our sister city. Um, I, it's occurred to me today, um, we could talk to Kathy Weisman at the Pioneer Center, who's probably the best person to know who to reach out to uh, Takashi, um, Oregon City's sister city in Japan. Tateshina. Thank you. How do you say it again? Tateshina. Tateshina. All right. And um, uh, that program is... I haven't heard about it in, in some time. So um, that would be a, a nice way to bring that back in as well. Um, so oh, can, one more thing. Yeah. Another thing I forgot to mention is the gentleman who's been conducting um, documenting, film documents, documenting, documentary. He's a documentarian. Um, his name is Dave Hedberg. He's been going to as many of the dedication events across the state as he's able to. Um, and he's been taking footage and then incorporating it into his documentary that he's compiling. Um, so I don't know where he's at in his stage where if he can accept more footage or not. But um, the hope is that when it does become final and he's able to show it, He's going to take it around to like film festivals and compete. He's excellent. Um, but he is willing to present the film um, at each city that has a peace tree. And it would be excellent for one, the one day when he, I think it's 2024, he plans to have the film available and then he could show it at the end of the Oregon Trail Interpretive Center because they have an auditorium. And then folks could then just walk outside and visit the tree. So... It yeah. seems like we have more opportunity, future opportunity to promote visibility, um, kind of further the message of what the peace trees are doing and trying to promote um, and keep more people visiting the tree. Um, so anyway, lots to look forward to. Um, I've seen the trailer or like the the short um, you know, snippet that he was able to share. And it's excellent. Um, uh, very moving. Very moving. Yeah. Um, so I think you would all enjoy meeting him and seeing the film when it's available. But he would do it for free. Sounds great. Yeah. That would be That's wonderful. Um, so Gail, I forget her last name, sorry, uh, director at the uh, EOT, uh, would be a good contact for us. And she would be extremely excited about this. I just know. So... Um. Oh, one one thing that I noticed, I was looking at the um, the Gladstone website um, for the park where the peace tree where they have their peace tree, um, and it's really cool to have like a drop down menu of the projects in the park, and then they have like its own little page for the peace tree. Um, and there's a bunch of images I haven't visited on person yet, but they have a like a metal kind of like grate around it, um, like I don't know three feet high or something. Um, and there was a bunch of ribbons on it. So I don't know if people are kind of like treating it like a memorial or, um, but I noticed that they had that protective thing kind of like, I don't know, maybe like four feet, five feet wide um, in addition to the mulch. So I don't know if that's something that we'd want to do with our peace tree or um, just to kind of give it like a little bit extra physical protection. Um, and then that way, because I know there's a lot of seasonal park staff and I think it would be impossible for them to familiarize themselves with like all of the various parks and of, like maintain around the trees so then that way it's very it's very clear that that area should not be weed eaten yeah and then people can put things on it if they have some kind of personal connection um you know to japan or to the peace trees yeah i think that's a good idea because we could put then the plaque on that little fence thing whatever it is so it'll keep the weed eaters away too yeah, <laughs> yeah. and the ribbons i spoke with the folks from Gladstone and they personally invited um, folks from the city and 
you know, folks from NRC or anyone interested to come and like we can make a date to go with them and talk about what their intentions were around the way they put their piece tree in, how they set up the the little low gate fence situation, and then the ribbons, all of that was intentional. Um, so they, you know, would love to have Oregon City, who's trying to um, develop our dedication event and our peace tree um, location to be as, you know, meaningful uh, they would be happy to have us and um, have a discussion while visiting the trees. So uh, we can trips, make something so. happen. Yeah, that would that would be such a fun event. <laughs> yeah, that sounds great. Um, Do that. I would love it if one of you guys potentially could come to Prague or go to Prague and bring this up and, and kind of advocate. I can bring it up as like a public comment. <laughs> Yeah, or even better, ahead of time, just coordinate with Kendall Reed and try to get oh. on get on the schedule as a as a as a presentation item. Um, um, so happy to help try to facilitate that. I can't remember when they meet next, but uh, that we can term in pretty quickly. Yeah, I'm happy to do that with you, Emily, if you want to. Okay. Work yeah, together. Cool. That yeah, cool. mm -hmm. that would be good because right. uh, we always need to coordinate with Prac on, on stuff that's in parks, uh, whether it's a wetland or a tree or something like that. But this is an opportunity. I see mm -hmm. the twenty seventh. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, that's right. It comes up at the what is that? The last uh, yes. Thursday of the month. Okay. I'll make it to do. All right. Great. Thanks. I think that would give us some good traction too. Yeah. Okay. Um, pardon my dog. <laughs> Some of you is dog. It's dog night. <laughs> He's a feisty one. Um, I've got too much stuff open. I can't find it. Emerald um, Ashbore next. Emerald Ashbore. Thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, we have determined that we are going to try to spend not a whole lot of money, but enough money for a flyer. Um, it's pretty expensive to do a color one. Um, anyway, let me back up a little bit and share the uh, current website. And I'll see if y'all can see that, our famous Emerald Ashbore. Um, Jude added a really good example of a D-shaped exit hole. Would be nice uh, to have scale on that. Yeah, yeah, okay. That looks yeah. really big and I know that they're pretty small. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're trying to scare people. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I, I agree. Um, uh, not a great picture of a uh, ash tree, but um, and good to have a picture of maybe a close up of the leaves. Yeah, we got we get this one, oh, but it's not a close up. And so we'll no. try to make this a little bigger. And Fractionus americana, Excelsior. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, if this would pop out more, that'd be nice. Um, the we talked about the, what the ODA is doing. And I think what we needed to do, what John Lewis had asked for, in fact, was a little more clear link to reporting site. Right now, we just have it as what can, what can you do? You can identify the ash borer, which will take you over to um, the extension website, um, which is not loading. There it is. Right. There it is. Um, um, how to identify the ash tree. Boom. Good resources. Yeah. Um, and then the online reporting thing, which is the Oregon invader. Report an invader. 
<laughs> invasive species but this is the link to that so we're going to try to make that pop a little more and make it more obvious uh and then um jude has not started designing the uh, flyer yet but um we'll want to run that by you as soon as we get that up and running yeah i think there's some work to do here i mean all these ash trees are about to lose other leaves right so yeah. we, we can identify ash trees on uh like bud patterns and stuff but you know i, I guess maybe a comment for jude or for this page is if we're going to give this information to the public in the winter we should provide some winter tree id mm, yeah tips you know okay yeah especially because ash are kind of unique and they're they're in that like opposite bud group yeah um which is a smaller group it makes it easier to kind of like at least narrow down and their bark looks very similar to oak bark because yeah, yeah super easy a lot to of stuff mix up in Cozine creek and mcminnville there were oak and ash and until they leafed out i had a heck of a time you know i'd have to like see if i could get a branch to look at budding so yeah yeah so okay. yeah. the folks on this call who are such experts on this can you educate me a little bit is what's the way to identify an infested tree is it generally i'm guessing it's not finding a live bug right it's probably an exit hole or egg site Usually what they're finding, the guy who found them basically noticed that the, the ash trees in, I think, Forest Grove had a lot of dead foliage. Okay. And then he started looking closer and found one. And so, found a, a beetle itself. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, that and he's an in entomologist, by the way. Like, he's a... Okay. He kind of was, you know, specifically trained in this sort of detection. So it's just yeah. incidental that he found yeah. the way he did find it. Um, but he's an infectious, he's an infectious pest. Expert. Yeah, he was like the most expert like the of expert person. people to possibly yeah. accidentally find something. Yeah. Um, yeah, he was there for like his kids had a sporting event over there, and it's like just it's so serendipitous it's just wonderfully nice that he found it i mean it's horrible that he found it but i'm glad right. he found it when he did so yeah. that was the first sighting yeah. in this region yeah oh. the, last, the closest it had been was colorado yeah and so everybody was figuring oh we've probably got at least 10 years before it gets here and then it's like wham no somebody brought something from colorado and and if it's there it's probably in a lot more places but well, now that I'm looking at the extension website, which is excellent, in my opinion, from what I'm seeing, um, it's, I think we can just make a clear and link to this so that people can just go here. Yeah. Um, yeah. Rather than yeah. us trying to replicate this. Right. Um, yeah. Thanks. So that's uh, it's really important. Uh, okay. Cool. Your tree ID tip is that's that's crucial. Although uh, that's, that's what that's I was a good trying idea. to see on this, but I don't see a winter tree twig ID. Anyway, yeah. Um, I can share a picture from my winter sure. woody plant identification book. Um, All right. The, it's mostly the bark and the bud that Nancy was talking about. So the best description I had when I was learning my trees for ash, and it's indicative of all ashes, is the bud it looks like the beak of a parrot with like a cookie in it. I always learn Hershey Kiss because it has that recurve. Right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, that's the best way I learned. It looks like the parrot, the carrot. No parrot beak with a cookie in it um, and when i share the picture i hope it like <laughs> and you see it in every ash it looks the same wow um, and we have which opposite is, buds which is other yes. than maple around here there's not a lot of other things with opposite buds yeah and maple bark looks completely different than ash bark so right, right. so i'll share a, a picture that i have from my woody and okay. i learned all my trees in winter so ah. coming from michigan for you <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. I, uh, I was a summertime ID person. I haven't done that one yet. 
Um, cool. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. So that takes care of the EAB. Clackamas County Courthouse project. Yeah. Okay. So Clackamas County Courthouse. Right now, the courthouse is downtown. There's been long. It's been a long time coming. Uh, the county has, you know, their campus up at the Hilltop Mall, and it's slowly coming in and building. Um, you know, they built the Development Services Building, a six-story tall, and the main administration building, six-story tall. Courthouse will be six stories tall um, and oriented perpendicular to both the EAB sorry the development services building and the administration building uh, across the plaza from there on the back side so in order for them to build it which would be a 250,000 square foot building um, and associated parking they're um, taking out a significant number of existing parking lot and landscaping trees um, we are going to create a project web page uh, they're currently in completeness review for the review of that building um, and in it we will have a link to their arborist report um, which Todd Prager and associates was the arborist to put together the tree inventory and calculated how how many mitigation and replacement trees they would need to replant um, we calculate mitigation trees in addition to regular landscaping trees and in addition to street trees um, so they will have to do quite a bit of mitigation um, a lot of the trees that they inventoried were not at six inches yet even though they had been growing in the parking lot or where else you know for some time um and then there were some larger conifers and they're growing in the grass and the landscaping outside of that um so anyway that's going on uh, the actual number of trees on the inventory that is uh, proposed for removal is 173 give you some idea of the scale of the project because they're not just putting they're not just taking out trees where the building is going they have to relocate a major water trunk main and a sewer main and then uh, tear up some of their existing parking to do new parking and then a lot of excavation for the secure sally port place where they go in and um, have um, uh, so, uh, not cells, but holding facilities for people who are awaiting trial and that kind of thing. So, uh, big, big building. Um, so that's going on. Mud Creek, as you probably know, Mud Creek is a perennial stream that runs through there, runs in the river. Uh, what's the name? Hillendale Park. So it's part of the same stream system, but they're not uh going to be touching the stream itself they are planning to uh replace a uh stormwater line to mud creek then there's an outfall there and so it once it's treated once the stormwater is treated it goes into this pipe and then it runs into mud creek um so that's part of it they want to do some early work um early grading and utility line relocation and build an access road in from library court um so uh they've submitted a series of what are type one minor site plan applications which they would they could do if they weren't building this big building they could come in and they could do a type one minor site plan for tree removal and replacement to meet our code which is chapter 1741 um, and that's something that we are looking at and have signed off on but the work is not going to begin for some time because they still have to get grading permits and a lot of other legal easements and things like that from public works uh, i just wanted to let the natural resources committee know about this and know that um, even though it's a type one at this stage and we haven't deemed the type two portion of it complete we are going to put a web page up with those documents so that people can go to it um, even though you can't 
comment on a type one. It's not a formal land use application, but the replacement requirements will be deferred to the type two and um, uh, and uh, that will be a public notice of comment type situation. They just uh, have such a lot of work to do that they have asked to get some early early utility work done, and I th that includes the tree removal. At this point, I don't know when that tree removal is going to happen, um, but um, uh, probably be once I hear back from their contractor, we will have a clearer idea of when that's about to happen. Um, Public Works is obviously concerned that um, you know any work that they do do for the takedown or demolition part of the job um, will sit until uh, the construction period in the winter time is kind of delayed, right? So there could be some significant site impacts and that sort of thing um, without a lot of activity going on in the winter time but um we'll we'll try to keep people informed about that and, and their intent is to try to get the building up as soon as possible mm -hmm. sam i was going to ask so i know i'm a little familiar with the courthouse design um from a couple years ago mm -hmm. but my thinking is that they're going to be putting it right where the current storm water facility is so if they take out a bunch of the trees that stormwater facility will still have to sit there and try to capture most of that runoff mm -hmm. in the meantime and thus create more burden so i'm curious if there's a way we can convince them to postpone it till the dry season so that there's less impact and they have opportunity to maybe start building like the next storm facility that's going to take over once they build on okay. top of this one um, because this is going to have impact on city water treatment as well as flooding yeah potential. i don't know but i'm i'll talk to josh wheeler because i'm pretty sure that the stormwater and grading design standards are, are pretty strict i mean they kick in if you're not just put adding new impervious but if you're replacing um and they would want there to be an interim treatment situation going on uh until the uh storm water is fully implemented and um those standards are very much geared towards uh you know a tiered system of stormwater management that tries to infiltrate as much as possible on site but i'm guessing that there will undoubtedly be ponds in addition to swales and rain gardens and everything else. Um, uh, yeah, that site's that, pretty clayy. Right. And I don't know if you've walked around there too much when it's wet, but it stays wet. It's pretty wet <laughs> when it's rainy. Yeah, that's and what um, that stormwater swale, that stormwater facility sure gets a lot of work. Mm -hmm. um, and it gets all the runoff from the parking lot um which it sounds like they're going to expand um so if they're going to obliterate that stormwater spill on top of removing all the trees they're going to create a lot more potential harm and like yeah. you know delays because of all the potential damage and flooding and and you know um and there's other facilities there's uh, i think there's the childhood services building back there too which is just slightly down slope from that spot so that could be a potential vulnerable target to flooding so i'd be okay. very careful yeah. about the order of events um, and maybe keeping those trees on site as long as possible just help mitigate flooding risk and extra burden on the storm treatment okay uh very good yeah um I will make a note of that and send it over to, to Josh Wheeler um, and try to get you the information back um, once the uh, once the website's up. We'll put the stormwater plan on there that they have. 
and we may want to revisit this in November as well. Sounds like. Thanks for bringing that up. Uh, let's see, B City US. Uh, anything more on the courthouse? Uh, okay. Uh, B City USA. Um, haven't had a chance to follow up on this. Um, Aquila, my my director, has said that uh, I can talk to the person at the. Um, sorry, uh, where am I? Where's my note? Uh, Ross Hoover at City of Tualatin about their program. Um, I wanted to ask whether an NRC member would like to volunteer to kind of lead the BCD USA uh, endeavor. Um, okay. Um, really need an advocate uh, for that. Uh, so if one of you wants to do that, that would be great. And I've been talking, talking um, I don't know, like the order of um, that these things happen, but um, you know, I, I think I mentioned last time Sharon Salvaggio is with Xerxes Society um, and she's she's like right off Lynn Avenue um, and she has said that she'd be happy to come give a talk um, to any government um, like city staff or um, volunteer boards um, about B-City just to answer questions um, and she has been with Xerxes for a while now and she has a really extensive background in integrated pest management. Um, she's just a really excellent, excellent resource. I think that it would be really educational to have her come and talk to as many people as possible, even if it's something that the city decides not to do, um, just to have her come and talk so that people can know that it's a resource. Um, they've got, Xerxes does a lot of really excellent studies um, like on pollinator plants and they're doing more like studies on, on trees and how they impact local ecosystems and uh yeah i think just having her come and give a talk would be would be really great okay um why don't you if you could read out yeah. we'll reach out to her and uh we will try to squeeze her on our next agenda if she's available oh. okay. yeah that'd be great um i guess the only question i have um so she, a, a lot of times when they when they do kind of like these talks they tend to be like an hour long um i don't know how long i think that mm -hmm. um you know, we can certainly have time for question and answer, but I think it might be beneficial to have her for more than like a 10 minute mm -hmm. because there's so much and mm -hmm. um, there's so many, there's like 80 something affiliates now. And I think that uh, there's such a range in what B-City can do in terms of providing resources. And so, um, yeah, it, it might just be like a slightly longer conversation if there's room I think well, the other part the other thing that occurred to me Emily was that um, we have a great resource in the library staff which oh, okay. we don't tap into nearly enough um, they could uh, they could potentially you know help schedule a, a, a more of a community oriented presentation over at the library or something like that okay yeah so greg uh let's see greg williams i believe is our library director okay. um and i think he'd be interested i don't know i haven't talked to him about it yet but that's that would be a good good thing to uh, talk up because they've got the space over there at the library okay. and they've and it's such a good location were you thinking mm -hmm. that um to be like in addition to having her come to possibly NRC or yeah. okay yeah <laughs> you know um but yeah um definitely get on the schedule for for us and then okay. in the meantime we can also reach out to Greg and see whether we could get. A yeah, that'd be that'd be such a fun event. Thank you for suggesting that. And I, I, this always happens to me. You know, I get my blinders on and I think about what our department has resources for, which is very little um, beyond land use review and stuff like that. But, um, you know, uh, the the library staff are. Um, there's a lot of part-time work workers there, but at the same time, they have a lot of uh, media and uh, outreach capability. So, yeah. 
Yeah, I will. Um, I will definitely reach out to her to see if she's available for, let's say, so that would be um, November 9th then mm -hmm. for that meeting. Okay. And then just, just so I can kind of give her um, opportunity to prepare like yeah. an adequately like timed event, like how oh, long yeah. I think a we? half hour is what okay. do you guys think? Is that yeah, half hour with time, you know, afterward for mm -hmm. discussion and question and stuff like that. Okay. And uh, th yeah. And then in terms of talking up our meeting, um, I would want to try to get that over to our um, Tuck it up as a news item on the web by on the on the website. We don't do that on a, often enough either. As advertise, I mean, we we do have our NRC meetings there, but it's not like NRC this month. <laughs> Come see the famed Emerald Ashbor, <laughs> somebody, some other <laughs> culprit. Um, yeah, but that's that's something that we could potentially do. I'd like to incorporate that a little bit more. Yeah, that'd be good because sometimes the meetings we have had stuff that had been great if a lot more of the general public had been able to come, had known about it. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Thank Emily. You. Yeah, and yeah. I'll reach out to, um, you said it was Ross Hoover in Tualatin? Ross Hoover is the guy's name. Um, okay. And uh, yeah, that's awesome. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. And, and then I'll, yeah, and then I'll reach out to Greg Williams also after I ask Sharon if she would be interested in very cool. making a more public presentation. All right. Uh, final things that are definitely on on the on my radar, but um, so John Lewis um, and uh, Don Tapasadas, our right of way manager, have been. You know, the uh, city forest or city arborist position has not been discussed in, in a while with the city commission, uh, right. as far as I'm aware. So, um, but it is on John's radar, radar, and he did bring it up uh, in a meeting the other day. I just don't know where the discussion is going at this point. I don't and know what you invite I'm him to come. Mm -hmm. I'd really like to, I think. In order to get it past the city commission, I think we need to do a cost benefit analysis. I really mm -hmm. do. That was that became clear at the meeting that Sam and I were at, where I raised the issue and well, you know, how much would that cost and you know what's the value. So I really think we need to do that. So if we could get um, city staff to come and talk with us about that. You sent me an, that article about that some time ago, and I need to make sure that that gets forwarded along to John as an introduction um, mm -hmm. to kind of reinitiate, reignite the discussion here. Um, but if you would, if you resend me that, I will, I will do it. Is this the slides you're talking about, or? Because I would be happy to coordinate with uh, either the urban and community forester manager to come present mm -hmm. um, some evening that makes sense um, for everybody. And then he can do um, like in person and he can answer questions and speak to specific situations um, and really highlight the so he was an urban forester before he got into this new position. He was mm -hmm. in Eugene mm -hmm. and um, he's an excellent person in general, very personable, um, very friendly and super knowledgeable. And he's also an ISA arborist. Um, so I think he would be ideal to get. Um, if I can't get him, I might be able to get his recently retired predecessor who's got a, maybe a little more time um, to basically speak on the same topic. Okay. So you're saying invite him to NRC, invite John to the same meeting and have the discussion here with the right. NRC. Yeah. Okay. If that is appropriate, yeah. if that's of interest to everybody. No, I think that's a good idea. Um, mm -hmm. You can kind of get, you know, straight from the horse's mouth in that case about, because John's very busy. He's got 
and his focus is on public works, which is its own niche of professional expertise. Mm -hmm. And he might know about how much staff time he's spending on street tree management, right. but he might not know what, you know, the other side of that question that you were asking Nancy, the cost benefits. Right. right. Um, so he might not provide the whole picture, um, which is what I think you're asking to present to the commission. Right. So I feel like if we had, you know, both sides present, like this is how much not having an urban forester looks like, and this is the benefits of having one would look like mm -hmm. and the cost of having it right. um, would be be able to get us most informed. Mm -hmm. That'd be great. Yeah. All right. Great. Just let me know um, a couple dates yeah. and then we can, we can invite. His name is Scott Baltenhoff. Um, and then Kristen Romsdott was his predecessor. Okay. Yeah. I knew Kristen. I haven't met Scott. Uh, cool. And then, uh, let's see. The final thing I have is um, for the future agenda item, um, we want to revisit our work plan for the oh. NRC, which we haven't done in a while. Um, That's so much fun. Isn't it great? <laughs> Always going. What do I get myself into? <laughs> I'm sorry. What you said? The the work. What I didn't the quite work hear. Plan, so the work plan. So work plan. Yeah. The... Work plan is sort of like where we're going to focus our energies on every year. Oh. And what are we going to try to accomplish with and that sort of thing? So exactly the type of things that we've been talking about. You know, what are our priorities? Right. Uh, are we spreading ourselves too thin? Is it realistic? Right. What are the staff resources? What are the what are the committee's resources and is there any budget to support it if there is no budget to support it are we going to make a recommendation to the city commission as as a result of our work plan um so that's something that now that we're almost fully staffed again we want to do um and it's something that when the um committee chair gives a report to the uh, city commission about what the committee's been doing every year, which we have to do, um, you know, we kind of tie it. We look at the work plan. Oh, right. Uh, yeah, right. So um, it used to it used to be, and it still is, a bit of a cumbersome document. Um, so the, to the extent we can simplify it for everybody involved, and be a much more effective thing. Um, so. It's really satisfying when we finally, though, can scratch that we did that. <laughs> yeah, that sounds really fun. <laughs> Are you serious? <laughs> I am, actually. I love making lists. <laughs> Although this sounds like more than a, than a list. But... Yeah. yeah. yeah it's, it's, it, it is a list, obviously. But, you know, it's, a, it's, 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 it's got um, things that, well, uh, it, it, sh it should have uh, measurable outcomes. Yeah. And if stuff falls off it every year that's, you know, not attainable, then maybe that's the reason for that, you know. So um yeah. has changed quite a bit. So I can see that some of the things that were driving forces for past committee members may not be driving forces. We seem to have different things that we're interested in mm -hmm. as a group. So so probably want to tackle that between well we're coming up to the end of the year so um we could put it potentially on a november meeting and not spend a whole lot of time on it but at least uh get it before you and 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 strike some things off a list I know sometimes we've started an hour early, so that's know. true. Thanks. Um, uh, yeah, we've. I don't we've, know we've, if how um, problematic that would be for people with work schedules because six is already pretty early for probably a lot of people. Chris is not. Yeah. In that. So. Um. So yes, yeah, kind of bleeds into the discussion of what we want on the next agenda. Right. Um, we're talking about um, having the the B city 
the, the Xerces person come? I think it would be more fun to do the presentation with B City and also have the uh, discussion about City Forest or potentially, yeah. but those two big two big items right there. Uh, so the work plan could potentially be in December. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to send a draft of that template that we saw last year? Yeah. Because it's really helpful. Look at it and go, oh, my word. <laughs> yeah. But at least start looking at it and realizing what we've been talking about is what we see as priorities compared to what we saw in the past. I don't think we've looked at it for a couple of years. No, you're right. Look at it all year. So. so it'll be new and fresh and different, <laughs> completely refangled. <laughs> so okay. I don't mean to be flippant. I do. I do want it to be a, a, a document that we are, enjoy looking at and refer yeah. to. So I was being a little snarky earlier because if <laughs> you look at it, I go, "Oh, not this again." <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> but yeah. Okay, is there anything else on the agenda? Um, I, I think uh, there was, I don't re remember where this came from, but the Heritage Tree Code uh, has a section where, um, or needs a section where we talk about maintenance obligations of the property owner. Nancy, do you know a little bit about this? I know that we need to add it. I don't know, you know. Yeah, I mean, the language is in the covenant that we record. Um, and there is some language about it, but um, I think you some of the city that. commissioners feel it is important for it to be more clear in the code as well. If you want to send me what's in the covenant, then I can see. And I know that that Didi has requested, and, and when I was helping Didi fill out the form for the tree close to me, um, the form on there has, you have to have these specific things in there. And then there's another sheet that comes with it with what you have to talk about. And a lot of that stuff wasn't on the form. So that just drove me crazy. Like, what do you mean you have to, that doesn't, the form doesn't say you need to talk about that and do this and do that. And so, you know, it, it seems like the, the form that you fill out and send in should be complete with everything that the city wants you to have. Because that was very, very confusing to me. Mm. I didn't even know that. I just printed out the form and then DD comes with this other stuff going, oh no, and you have to talk about this and you have to talk about that. I'm like, what? <laughs> so yeah. So we need to do some work on getting the form to match with the, everything the city wants. So okay. yeah. Um all right. If you send me all that stuff, I'll start messing around with the street tree or the heritage tree stuff. Okay, I can send you the word documents. Yeah, that'd be great. All right. Then I can make corrections with, you know, suggestion things and send it. Everybody can look at it. Okay. We can talk about it at some point in the future. All right. Great. Uh, thank you. That's all I have. Anybody else? I don't know how relevant this is, um, but I've been seeing a lot of box elder bugs out, um, and I think they're this year they're coinciding with stink bugs um and so which are invasive you know box elders are native um and i i don't know like o osu i th i sent you all an email with a, a good i'm i'm sure that you all can identify them very easily but the general public i think is oft often um mistakes the native um box elders for the invasive stink bugs and then are confused when they squish them and it doesn't have the funny smell so um, I don't know if putting out something, just like a Facebook post, just so people know that there's two bugs out um, that are like not typically seen in very high numbers that may or may not be like trying to get into warm oh, yeah. houses right now. Um, and they're really easy to identify. So it's not like the, um, the ash bore where like you need kind of like precise technical knowledge to I identify certain anatom anatomies. Yeah, and when they fly, they're red. So um, that's also a really easy way to identify them because they don't, they're very like hyperactive compared to the stink bugs, which just kind of hang out on the wall. Um, but yeah, I think, I don't know like how to best reach people, but the box elder bugs are native and they don't harm plants and they're good guys. So I think that, you know, the more people that know that, the better. <laughs> yeah, that would be a good thing. You know, the city's got a Facebook site. It seems like. Yes. Yeah, I don't know. No. 
Because that seems like a good way to reach people. I think, yeah, I think for the time being, until we have a communications coordinator, the uh, assistant to the city manager is coordinating Facebook posts, and that's okay. Lisa, Lisa Orskovich. Okay, I can. Uh, you want to send her two pictures and say, you know, this would be really valuable for people in our city. Yeah, I can definitely. Email. Well, yeah, we you're, part, you're doing it on the part of the NRC, so. <laughs> All right. The, so these stink bugs. Okay, yeah, I had like five of them, and if they were in my uh, yard furniture. In the covers on the yard furniture, and I'm like, oh, okay, what's going on here? Oh, yeah, and that link also had really good information on how to deal with stink bugs without uh, pesticides because um, they, they don't stick around for a very long time. Um, and so I think also, yeah, I will, I'll get in touch with Lisa because I don't know how much longer they're going to, the box elders are really going to be out for. So it's a timely matter. <clears throat> that'd be good. Yeah, that'd be excellent. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Anything okay. Else? Oh, Sam. Sorry. Go. No. Having difficulty with my mute button. Um, I wanted to bring up something that we could talk about some other time, but it's about the hazard tree assessment for the city mm -hmm. and when they're conducted and how they're conducted. Um, it seems that. So I've looked at some that we've gotten in the email, and I haven't seen any. Has, tree hazard assessments from an arborist like they they only talk about oh it's raising the sidewalk or it's buckling this the street or something and then that's due to city definition called a hazard tree but the industry like arborists industry has its own standard which i feel is much more um uniform and reliable and um has much more like peer review and scrutiny attached to it than our own city code, which seems pretty loose. Um, so I'd like to look at that code a little more so that we can attach more professional quality to it, um, especially in assessments so that trees aren't coming out um, by an arborist that's not certified for tree risk assessment. We have to have a report that defines all the qualities of a hazard tree as defined by the industry and also protect trees that actually aren't hazard trees. Um, if it's buckling a sidewalk, you just fix the sidewalk. Right. Um, and if it's buckling the street, well, you can just patch the street. So um, taking out a whole tree just on those kind of really thin complaints is problematic for our tree canopy, especially if those trees are mature, you know, shade providing specimens, which I would want, you know, I'm sure the city would care about protecting them as well. So I just want to kind of bring the code up to standard and make sure that not only are we up to standard with tree risk assessment, but also that the arborist providing the assessment is not also contracted to take out the tree, mm -hmm. which is ripe for conflict of interest so um so people can hire an arborist that they say yeah i'll take out that tree and i'll call it a hazard tree if you pay me yeah but conflict of interest is going to decimate our tree canopy so yeah. i want to talk about that more sometime yeah that's i think really that's part of the reason that i i think we really need a city forester too who is an arborist who can actually make those assessments. So if somebody from the community comes in, I go, well, I have this disease tree in front of my, in my street tree, I'm going to take it out that this city, somebody in the city who's certified arborist can go and look at that and say, no, that tree can easily be saved and, you know, or it can't be saved, but it's not the person taking the tree out. It's a separate entity. Right. And they have a, a more detailed analytical approach to assessing the tree, assess, the tree risk, not just the general health or potential health of the tree. So that document can provide, you know, legal liability protection mm -hmm. for a landowner, um, which I think everyone in this litigious, uh, you know, uh, state of being could appreciate. So, yeah. Yeah. um, 
So that's another layer of protection an arborist, a city forester would provide as well. Uh -huh. So at any rate, um, just for future discussion. Yeah, that would that would be definitely part of the wider uh, street tree code amendment. Uh -huh. Thanks, that's all I have. Mm -hmm. Okay, so anything else? I don't know how relevant this is, but um, just a quick like success story. I wasn't there, but the um, the Ivy Pole at Singer Creek, um, I was filled in, and I guess there were like approximately 15 volunteers, um, 30 to 35 trees that had ivy removed. So that's that's cool. The Greater Oregon City Watershed Council is seems really dedicated to improving um, that stream habitat. Um, and then uh, Elyville Neighborhood Association um, is working with Vance at Public Works to plant native wildflowers and some right of ways. So they're going to do a trial project starting next spring. Um, I think in three right of ways and then around some some of the grates around trees. Excellent. That's great. Thanks. Yes. Thanks for doing that. Just to be clear, I didn't do anything. Um, I'm just reporting what other <laughs> well oh you're you're promoting awareness. <laughs> okay. Uh, Anything else? No, oh, that was a lot. It was a lot. That's good though. Covered a lot tonight. Okay. I call this meeting adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>